Thank you. What a, what a pleasure to be here. What a great topic, the end of school. Yay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, a, uh, I'm an evolutionary psychologist, and what that means is that I'm interested in human nature. I'm interested in how that nature came about by biological evolution, by natural selection. I'm particularly interested in the nature of human children, and most particularly, in that aspect, those aspects of children's nature that lead them to become educated. So the big idea that I'm here to talk about is this, that children are biologically designed to educate themselves. They do it joyfully through play, questioning, and exploration. We don't need to educate children. All we need to do is to provide the conditions that would allow them to educate themselves. The basic instincts of childhood, their playfulness, their curiosity, their willfulness, their sociability, have been honed by natural selection to serve the function of education. But we take those abilities away when we put them in school and prevent them from educating themselves. My argument is that we, if we provide the conditions that children need to educate themselves, we really can do away with schools as we know them. Now, some of you, some of you might be thinking that I'm crazy. Some of you, more kindly, might be thinking that I'm a hopeless idealist. But I assure you, I am neither. I'm a hard-headed realist. I've done a great deal of research on this topic. The idea that I'm talking about today is supported by a great deal of empirical observation and research, which is elaborated upon in my book, but which here I have just a few minutes to try to convince you is worth uh, thinking about. The first way I want to think about this idea is by looking at hunter-gatherer cultures. Now, we were all hunter-gatherers until relatively recently in history from a biological point of view. Some people in certain isolated parts of the world have survived as hunter-gatherers into modern times, and anthropologists have found them and studied their cultures. A few years ago, a graduate student of mine and I conducted a survey of 10 different anthropologists who had studied seven different hunter-gatherer cultures among them on three different continents. We asked them questions about how children became educated in that culture. One of our questions was, how much time do children in the culture that you observed have to play and explore on their own? And the answer that we got from every single one of these anthropologists was all the time. The children and even the teenagers are free to play and explore in age-mixed groups away from adults all day long, every day, and in the process they become educated. Another question we asked was, how do they play? What are the forms of their play? And what we found from that, from, from these uh, anthropologists, was that they play at the very activities that are hardest to learn and are most important to learn for success in their culture. So they play at hunting and gathering and finding roots and digging them up. They play at building things like huts and dugout canoes and bows and arrows and musical instruments. They play at the music and dance and art of their culture. They play at those things that they have to learn to become educated. The anthropologists also told us, and I've seen it in writing many times, that they have never seen brighter, happier, more resilient, more self-reliant children than the hunter-gatherer children that they observe. So the question is, could this work in our culture? At first gloss, you might think, of course it can't. <laughs> you know, we're not hunter-gatherers. There are things that we have to learn that hunter-gatherer children don't have to learn, like reading, writing, and arithmetic. And moreover, it's not so easy for children in our culture to be exposed naturally to all the skills and, and knowledge that's important to the culture. So I might think that it wouldn't work except for the fact that for many years now I've been an observer 
and researcher at the Sudbury Valley School in Framingham, Massachusetts. This school was founded in 1968, so it's now been in existence for almost half a century. It has about 150 students at any given time, age four on through about 18. It has uh, about eight staff members, adult staff members. It operates on a budget that's about half of what the local public schools cost. And it accepts essentially all students who apply. There's, so this is not elite education. This is eminently affordable. Now, the unique things about this school are the way it is administered and the educational philosophy of the school. The school is, is, operates as a, uh, as a participatory democracy. All of the school rules are made by a school meeting at which each student and each staff member has one vote, and the rules are enforced at a judicial committee by a judicial committee which is modeled after the jury system of our larger culture. At any given time, there's one little kid, one middle-sized kid, a couple of teenagers, and one staff member on the judicial committee, and if somebody, whether it's a staff member or a student, violates a rule at the school, they're brought up before the judicial committee, which makes a decision about guilt or innocence and a decision about uh, what the punishment might be if, if found guilty. So that's the way the school operates. In terms of the educational philosophy, it's essentially the same as that of a hunter-gatherer band. The school offers no curriculum, no tests, no grades, no substitutes for grades. It expects children to decide themselves what they want to learn, how they want to learn, what they want to do. If you were to go through the school at any given time of day, you might see scenes such as on this slide. You would see children in the art room making, making various kinds of art projects. You'd, you might find somebody cooking in the kitchen. You would always find some people in the computer lab. You might find somebody in the photo lab. You might find children building with blocks in the children's playroom. Children playing music in one of the music practice rooms. Kids drawing playfully at a blackboard. Children, young people maybe playing a game such as chess. Outdoors, you might find people playing down by the brook or climbing boulders or fishing in the pond or playing a game on the athletic field or strumming a guitar and talking and singing. In the winter, you might find people building a snowman or skating on that pond that they fished in in the fall. You might also see them playing in more traditional playground uh, ways. The key to learning at this school is age mixing. The children are not segregated by age. The older children are naturally drawn to the little kids and the little kids are naturally drawn to the big kids. The little children observe what the older ones can do and they want to do that. They want to be able to read if they see older ones read. They want to be able to climb trees if they see older ones climb trees. They also learn by interacting with the older ones. In age-mixed games, the older children are constantly scaffolding the behavior of the younger ones, bringing them up to higher levels of performance. So, for example, many children at this school learn to read because they play games that involve reading with kids who know how to read. And the kids who know how to read more or less teach them to read, not because they're trying to teach them to read, but because they almost need to do so to play the game. The advantage of age mixing also goes the other way. The older children are learning to care and be nurturant, to be leaders by helping the younger ones in this setting. And they're also being continuously inspired by the creativity and the energy of the younger ones. So the age mixing is, at, is as valuable for the older kids as for the younger ones. The best evidence that this school works comes from follow-up studies for the graduates. Quite a number of years ago, I, along with a colleague, David Chanoff, conducted one such study. We found essentially all of the people who had graduated from that school, almost all of them agreed to be in the study. And what we found was that they were doing very well out there in the world. They, were, they had no problems in higher education if they chose to go that way. 
and they were in a wide variety of careers. They were essentially, all of them, very satisfied with their lives. Many of them, and this is really interesting to me, many of them were pursuing careers that were direct extensions of passions and interests that they had developed in childhood play. So for example, one of the graduates was a machinist and an inventor. He was somebody who loved to build things as a kid. There was another who loved boats, who was now the captain of a cruise ship. There was another who, uh, who, who was fascinated by computers, loved computers, who had developed his own software company. There was another who loved making doll clothes, who is now a pattern maker in the high fashion industry. And I could go on and on with such examples. People who have time to really pursue what they like to play at could find ways of making a living at that. So on through the rest of their life, they were doing what they were really interested in doing. Since uh, the time of my study, a couple of uh, other studies of the school have been conducted by staff members of the school, Daniel Greenberg and Mimsy Sadovsky, and have been published as books. And they came to essentially the same conclusion uh, as we did. The Sudbury model is replicable. More than three dozen schools modeled after it exists, mostly in this country, some in other countries. Um, that one of the closest to, to here is the, in fact, the closest to here is the Tallgrass Sudbury School in, uh, in Riverside, Illinois. Success at these schools, as far as I can have been able to tell, doesn't seem to depend on socioeconomic class. It doesn't seem to depend on the particulars of the student's personality. Now here I want to describe the conditions that I think are common to a hunter-gatherer band and the Sudbury Valley School and that really are the conditions that optimize children's abilities to educate themselves. So the first condition is a clear understanding that education is the child's responsibility. When children know that they're responsible for their education, they take that responsibility. When they believe, they're led to believe that somebody else is responsible for their education and all they have to do is do what they're told, then they tend to do that in the minimal way and they don't take responsibility for their education. Second condition, unlimited opportunity to play, explore, and pursue your own interests. Unlimited time, not an hour a day, not two hours a day, unlimited time. It takes time to try out different things. It takes time to get bored to overcome boredom, to find your passion, and it takes time to become, to really delve into your passion. It takes unlimited amount of time. You can't interrupt that with bells and telling people constantly what to do and expect people to really develop a passion. Three, opportunity to play with the tools of the culture, to really play with the tools of the culture. In a hunter-gatherer culture, those would be bows and arrows and knives and fire and digging sticks. In our culture, of course, the main tool is a computer. And it's not surprising that children everywhere in our culture love to play with computers. They know in their bones that this is the tool of the culture. And they need to spend a lot of time with it. So it becomes, in a sense, an extension of their own body. Access to a variety of caring adults who are helpers, not judges. How important that last part is, helpers, not judges. The last person you want to go to to help you learn something is somebody who's evaluating you. You're nervous about that person. That person is a person you go to in, in more of a, a, of, of a frame of mind of trying to impress that person with how much you know, not to say, I really don't know this and I would like some help with this. So by by not judging the children, the staff members are much more able to be helpers to the children than teachers in a typical school could be. Free age mixing among children and adolescents, I've already described that, that's absolutely key to the school. The school would not work if it were children all the same age because children don't have much to learn from others who are the same age. They learn from children who are older and from children who are younger than themselves. Six, immersion in a stable, moral, democratic community. Both 
a hunter-gatherer band in the Sudbury Valley School are, in their own different ways, democratic communities. They're communities in which every child knows that their ideas and their actions influence the others involved in the community. So they're growing up in a setting where they feel responsible not just for themselves, but for the community within which they are developing. And that is an extraordinarily important aspect of education and one which is almost completely ignored in our regular schools. Now what I want you to notice is that none of these conditions exist in our standard schools, none of them. It's as if we deliberately take away from children everything that they need to educate themselves when we put them in school. And then we try very inefficiently and very ineffectively to educate them. So I'm going to conclude this way. I'm absolutely sure that someday people are going to look back at us now and they're going to say, what were those people thinking? Why on earth did they ever believe that coercion is essential for education? That's like believing you have to force people to eat or you have to force people to breathe. Why on earth did they ever think that standardization such that people, regardless of their interests, regardless of their predilections, should all learn the same thing in the same way, be tested by the same tests. What kind of a crazy idea is that? I'm sure that we will reach the day where people will look back and say that. I hope we reach that day sooner rather than later. I would like to see it come in my lifetime. And I hope that some of you, maybe really all of you, I hope, will play a role in bringing that time about before too long. And with that, I thank you for your kind attention. I thank you for being here. And bless you all. ask just about any SVS student what they're going to do today, uh, chances are you're not going to get a very articulate answer. Maybe because they don't want to talk to you, but it's probably because uh, they don't know. But if you ask them like what you're interested in, I mean, that's, that's a whole different story. You'll probably get a very, very articulate answer. And a student not knowing exactly what they're going to do, but knowing what they like just going to immerse themselves in whatever interest that they have, whatever activity. It's a beautiful campus. It is soothing to come into. Uh, I feel like when you pull into the parking lot at school, it's just kind of escaping into our own little world where we can do whatever we want. We can do what we need to do without people interfering with that. You see how many green cards we have? I gave yeah, you all of mine. We have like 20. There's lots of different types of kids who come to Sudbury Valley School. Some have been here their whole lives. Some have just been here a couple of years. I spent four years at Sudbury Valley. And in my thesis, I like split up those four years um, into a different section. Because each one, I had like a, a uniquely different um, learning experience. And I had a, like a higher order of thinking every, every successive year. In my first year, I really spent most of that year just playing video games. One particular video game, actually. A lot of parents and a lot of people who don't know the Sudbury model like, ask me, like, well, 
don't kids just play video games all day? And like, well, what if my kid just plays video games all day? And uh, I mean, that's that's exactly what I did, and I certainly have no regrets. I did have a, a pretty close knit group of friends who all shared the same exact interests as I did, and uh, we were intensely involved in that community. I mean, it was it was just like anything else that you would be really intensely involved in. It just happened to be video games for us. How do you control it? Oh, here you go. How will you ever survive? They're all still on death. <laughs> They're just evil bouncy balls. One. Okay, I found a safe spot. I actually gotta fix this glitch. Yeah, well, in a couple couple minutes, you'll be blown away by my programming prowess. We studied those video games just like an economist would would study the stock market. And I think anything that you put effort into that type of effort into would yield some growth in any manifestation. A couple years ago at the picnic, I got together a five-on-five -five basketball game just because we had a lot of players here and it just seemed like a good idea. And after that was done, I realized I had a lot of fun. So when the school year started up, I just decided to start up my own basketball tournament. Hey guys, there's 10 seconds left. No one is forced to play. If you want to play, then we all have a great time. And there's little kids and there's big kids and there's medium-sized kids. We really try and make it as fair as possible. Athletics of the school take a big part in more than just my life. People are running around, playing tag, playing sports, throwing around in frisbee, swinging. I mean, when it's sunny and it's nice outside, you see people running around. And when it's raining outside and there's snow on the ground, we still play basketball at school. Oh, 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 oh. Can someone take a video? Press the center button and start filming. What? Press what? Center button. Okay. Is it filming? Well. Alright, come at me. Hey. There's escalator rock, there's either lunge rock, turtle rock, and there's another name for it, but I forget. Staircase rock. <laughs> Just a way of doing it. Climbing. Are you getting up this way? Yes, it's me a challenge. This is more challenging. <laughs> yeah. What? That? This yeah. Is, I think it's possible. Getting, yeah, well, everything's possible. Yeah. Before coming to Sudbury Valley School, I'd played guitar. It was a, a growing interest in the background. And then the summer after the first year, I spent some time at um, Berklee College of Music in a, in a guitar program. And it was like I had used my ears for the first time. In my second year, I was spending lots more time rehearsing for the SVS music productions that we put on a couple of times a year. And I was focusing a lot on that, on that stuff. And it shifted from that all video games to almost almost all music throughout that year, and that was that was my major focus. I really like being able to focus on something that really takes my interest and in having as much time as I want really to focus on it or not focus on it if I'm not interested. Upside down. Put something in there. Whatever color you want. I'm gonna mix flowers. Can you mix it in here? Good. They actually took away my art program at my old school, and I couldn't get through the day without art, and now I can do it all day, and I have the freedom to do it and to explore different mediums and explore different techniques. And I think that's really important in anything you do to have that sort of freedom. It's stuck there. I think it's good, Elizabeth. I think um, what I'm going to do is hook you and June together at this point because I just wanted to make sure that you were solid with the song, that you're solid. And I, she knows the piano part. Yeah. So now the two of you will put together an awesome band. Cool. I mostly play classical music. This year I've been focusing on Debussy, Haydn, and now I'm working on a Chopin piece. 
the moment I've got most of it roughed in, but I'm just working on this new section that I haven't really looked at before. I love having the pianos here at school because I can play just about whenever I want. There's a second piano up in the barn, so if this one's busy, I've always got another one. So I can practice for three hours a day if I want to. I mean, seriously, that monster is not big, but it's actually amazingly scary. The thing that I like about making the movies is that I like the when you're done and you get to watch it and say that you made that movie. The scene that I'm working on is about where the major gets taken captive by the humongous and is put in with all the other little kids that were taken by the humongous. Well, it first started out as a box, obviously. Um, then we got some foam pieces. We, what did we, Aaron, what did we do to stick these on? duct tape them on and then we got exp um, expanding foam and then had it as a snow monster and then we spray painted it for the spring monster. Yesterday I, when I was filming I had 15 kids up here and at times that was chaotic. We're six days into filming and we have three days left. <laughs> fundraiser for the music corp. All the money that we're raising goes to the music corp to help buy instruments and supplies so we can play more music at the school. Hi now. What? Well, pickle. I'm getting one meal, so yes, I am getting a pickle. How much? No. One. One. Does anyone here want an extra pickle? Take the pickle then. Yeah. I don't like pickles. I love pickles. I hate pickles. I love pickles. The Music Corp is a bunch of people who like music, so they have meetings, and you can be a director, so you get to vote on stuff for the Music Corp for what they buy, and they have meetings whenever they want to decide something important that has to do with musical instruments or fundraising or something like that. The shows happen four times a year. And people start getting ready for them since like the last show. People start rehearsing and practicing and deciding what songs they want. I'm usually in the shows every year and it's a lot of fun to be in them and see everybody and usually the whole school goes to them. My third year was it was a little bit of a contrast to the to the first two and that I was in the first two I had like a hobby that I was I was doing all the time. I was always busy with that. Um, and then my third year I spent a lot more time in the sewing room, which is a particular room of Sudbury Valley School that sees like the most amount of traffic, the most amount of conversation. It's a very, very crazy place. And I spent a lot of time in there just conversing and observing and listening to all these types of things being talked about. My most critical thinking was done during that year. I spent a lot of time just writing essays because I had talked so much uh, in the sewing room. We had so many both strange and intense uh, conversations. There was a lot of things that I, I wanted to not forget. <laughs> a lot of quotes from the day. And at first I was, I was just like jotting them down and then eventually I was writing full essays um, in an effort to not, to not lose any of the stuff that I thought was productive. Well, towards the end of my third year, I came to a couple of conclusions and I realized that while I absolutely love music, um, that I wouldn't make a career out of it. And I had sort of an intense, absolute passion for, for cognitive sciences and neuroscience, which came out of, of thinking about how we perceive music and how, you know, how music is such a fundamental aspect of you know, our cognitive processes. And more and more I decided that I was going to need to work up to a traditional like, college education to be able to go into this field. I call my fourth year like my adult year. I worked full-time job as a computer technician, but I also spent a lot of time formulating the plans and putting together like what I would have to do, what I'd have to accomplish to be able to, to get accepted by a university. There's a quality about Sudbury Valley School kids that whether they like it or not, they're absolutely unique. Uh, they have a really, really unique educational background. The school gave me the gift of time to let my own interests rise to the surface. 
When you sit down to paint, you don't just sit and paint. You have to think about what you're doing and why. Any creative effort, perhaps any effort at all, requires a great deal of thought, even reading a book. You don't just read a book, you think about what you read, otherwise you're doing it for nothing. The school gave us the gift of time to relax, to have those things come to the surface that were there. It gave us time for reflection, for the introspection that you need to really develop your own creativity. I think that's a remarkable thing. I'll call this school meeting to order. Everyone could please first turn off your cell phones and direct your attention to the results of previous school meetings. As the chairman of the school meeting, I am essentially the chief executive officer of the school, which means that I do a lot of things from signing staff contracts and also I'm ex officio on a lot of the important committees, which means that I run a lot of them. I'm automatically, as chairman, a member of those. So things like managing the budget or dealing with staffing and admissions. I also run the weekly school meetings and kind of just help to manage the day-to-day -day school affairs. Is there any discussion? If not, we'll vote. All in favor? All opposed? Motion passes. The school meeting is extremely important because it's basically what runs the school. Everything is decided in the school meeting. And, you know, we've delegated to the JC to deal with judicial matters, and we've delegated to certain clerks and committees to deal with things. But ultimately, school meeting is the authority. Everyone that comes to the school is a school meeting member. Everyone has an equal vote. And I feel like the community of the school really teaches kids that they, you know, they're just as equal as any other person here. And I think that translates in the school meeting. It doesn't matter if you're 4 or 16 or 75, everyone gets one vote. Everyone gets to talk. And we're all equals and we make the decisions together by majority vote. The world and the school is constantly changing and evolving and we do modify rules every now and then. And sometimes when we change one, we'll realize that that didn't quite work out and we'll go back and, you know, amend it or fix it. And uh, sometimes we realize there's, you know, new issues in the world that, you know, need tending to. We think about everything and we discuss everything and we debate everything. And if we didn't have the structure that we have of having two motions, a well-run school meeting where everyone gets their voice heard, the decisions that we made would not be as good. So at every school meeting, we have an agenda like this, and it has everything that you know we plan to discuss, every item of business. Can we have a report from the clerks? Francis. We have five finished, zero new, and zero work in progress. So we are now discussing regular JC business, which usually takes about the bulk of school meeting. So the school meeting reviews all the reports and sentences and charges that the JC decided on and sometimes they decide to change things, sometimes they don't. And we also deal with anything that has been referred to the school meeting. So that's usually more serious cases that the JC has decided they can't handle within their power. And then we move on to second readings, which is motions that we'll be voting on that day. And then written agenda, which is motions that were just put in, so we kind of discuss those and throw them back and forth. And then we'll vote on them next week. And then there's open agenda, which, you know, if there's an issue that wasn't in the written agenda, anybody can bring up. So you can say pretty much anything on the floor. And when that's over, we're adjourned. It's exciting and it's interesting. But the reason that it's the most interesting to me is because I really care what's going on in school. I mean, a lot of people, when there's something going on in JC that they think is important, will go to JC. And the same thing with school meeting. And I think it's really, really great because... I learned a lot from being JC clerk and I am learning a lot from being school meeting chairman and the whole process is one of the things that people benefit most from this school. Is there any discussion of the results?
Alaska. I will get one. All right, we have Isabella. Stand over there. So Danny brought you up in the office yesterday. Mm -hmm. Isabella was screaming in the office and hall and screamed at me when I told her to calm down. Oh. What happened? Okay. I was in the office talking. The JC is a group of kids and staff from the school, and we deal with when people break rules. And basically how the JC works is that if you see someone breaking a rule or they do something to you that you don't like, you can write a complaint, and then the JC reviews them, investigates them, and figure out kind of what happened and whether they broke a rule or not. It's kind of like jury duty in a way. You're chosen, you've got to show up on your day, 11 o'clock, you've got to stay there through the whole thing. You get a vote, you get to sit there. And we have a staff that joins us, and together we all decide. We all make the decision, we all make the choice of what the people are going to get as their charge, as their sentence, and it all works out. All in favor? I'll oppose report Approaching passes. passes. Alright, you want to call Sam in here? Nope. The way they made that is just, I think, genius. I mean, you get all kinds of perspectives from a little kid that might see only certain parts of the problem uh, all the way up to a staff member who might see beyond the problem or someone my age who might even understand my reasoning uh, more so than other people. I mean, the best part about it is that it's not just a kid my age uh, just saying, look, he's my friend, so I'm going to let him off. I mean, it's all these ideas coming together and making a, a final judgment. We have a lot of different rules, and most of them are basically common sense. But um, one of the biggest ones and one of the first ones we made was called infringement, which is basically that everyone has a right to you know, go about their day peacefully and be able to pursue what they want to pursue without people harassing them or being mean to them. So it's basically that you can't do anything to anybody that they don't want you to do. It's very nice to have this feeling in the community that if someone is bugging you or doing something you don't like, that you don't have to put up with it or you don't need to get an adult. You can say, stop or I'll bring you up. Well, when somebody writes a complaint, there's a line and they write witnesses. And so before we even call anybody in, the complainant, who's the person who wrote the complaint, or the person that they're writing the complaint against, we sort of talk about it as a JC and decide whether we want to talk to the person who wrote the complaint first, or maybe get one of the witnesses, sort of like, you know, a bystander that wasn't really involved, especially if it's a complaint which, you know, might be, well, so-and-so did this to me, but maybe he was provoked and the complaint doesn't say that. And you get to hear it from all sides and figure out really what happened from from everybody, not just the people who were involved. And from that, you'll, you'll write a report that goes with the testimony. You could write in it what people specifically said, what they didn't. Back in uh, public high school, you know, you do something, and even if the principal might feel like you didn't necessarily do such a bad thing, sometimes he would stick to the rule book and even give you a really bad, uh, I don't know, a uh, weekend of coming to school or something like that when you were just like five minutes late to, to class or something. Here, for example, if you break a rule even though there's no rule like that, you get to voice your opinion and whoever wrote the complaint gets to voice their opinion. They get to actually uh, come to a fair conclusion. I mean, you might have still broken a rule, so you will get a punishment, uh, but it might not be as severe, it might not be uh, you know, a, a strict, already set out rule book for that. So, I mean, that's just the, the best thing you could really ever ask for, I think, uh, for being a, a person my age or even a little kid, you know? So, uh, I definitely love that part about school and I respect it a lot. I think there's definitely a satisfaction in, for me, working towards what the truth is, how you're going to get at it, how you're going to figure it out. And once you're done with it, it's an awesome feeling. I think that the school's really cool, and I think it's really cool how people are allowed to have a say in stuff. Because the person who got brought up and the person who wrote the complaint, they both get to say what happened, and then they get to agree if they think that's fair or not. I think one of the keys is that it's a government by the peers. And I think that's one of the things that really hits home with people. 
it's your friends and the people that you see every day and want to spend time with who are saying, hey, don't do that. I like you, but you really can't do that here, and you can't do it in your life. Hey, Nell, could you stand over there behind David? Thanks. Um... There was a Hershey's candy bar wrapper littered yesterday with the initials E.D. Okay. Do you ever get things initialed E.D. or is it always We ending? are very clear about our procedures and everyone knows them from the minute they come into the JC for the first time. It's explained to them, younger kids and older kids. And, you know, a six-year-old is going to understand how to deal with something on a procedural level. You know, they say this is how it's done and this is the procedure and this is what order everything's going to happen in. And they understand both, you know, in the JC and in the school meeting. And if they're going to go into something like that in life after leaving school or while they're still at school, they're really going to understand that there is a procedure and that they have to follow it and how to follow it. It's explained to those. I think one of the things that sums it up is one of our most important rules is preamble, which says that all school meeting members are responsible for protecting the atmosphere of the school, which is of freedom and trust and fairness and order. That is just how we exist in school. We have a lot of rules, we really do. But all the rules are there to make sure that everyone can exist freely. When I first came to Sudbury Valley, my understanding was that my life as a kid, which was running around and doing what I wanted, was going to continue at SVS. Instead of going to a school where I would be sitting down and learning things in a set order, with my time all divided up. To me, the whole idea of sitting down was just anathema. I was not into sitting down. I was a runaround kid. I was outside through most of my early school career, even in the winter. And I couldn't understand how the whole idea of being penned up related to being a kid at all. When you're a little kid, adults seem really tired and slow, and there's this big feeling that that's going to happen to you one day. So you'd better play and have fun while you have all this energy. When I first started, I remember seeing students draped all over the place. What an interesting crew. I saw people sitting with sketchbooks. I saw people kicking back and reading for the joy of reading. I saw a kid playing guitar, and I was right over there in a second, listening, really interested. The school was more than I could have hoped for. What an explosion of things going on. You could smell the fresh food being baked in the kitchen, and you could hear music being played upstairs, and you could go through rooms full of books and books and more books and the pond, and just the way people were dressed and the way they looked. People were just letting it loose, not afraid to sit outside and read a book or play a guitar or be interested in something. We had our own world. We were solid in our own world. It was a world of children. We were so busy. At Sudbury Valley, there were always older kids who had done things that the younger group was trying to get to. You automatically wanted to be one of the people who could do it too, so you kept trying until you could do it. Everything was always, you have to get one step further. I don't know why. Something naturally makes you want to try, like tobogganing. Instead of tobogganing down this hill, you would toboggan down the hard hill, or you would go over the toboggan jump, or up at the rocks, you would jump across a wider ravine between two rocks. It was never stagnant. Everything was a challenge. The older kids weren't snobby or superior. I respected them because they were so much more experienced and they knew so many things that I didn't know. There were certain times when they'd interact with us and play, and then there were times when they'd be doing their own thing and we'd be doing ours sort of like different worlds that would come together for a reason and then go back to their own business. I've been told that as a kid I'd make friends with everybody. You know, I'd be in the grocery store and make friends with every person that passed and I was smiling and laughing and then I went to school. 
And in this school, you had to be that kind of kid. You know, the kid that would sit like this in the classroom and never would daydream about anything and never would, you know, possibly raise their voice or, you know, play around with the other kids or I, I don't know. I don't even understand the type of kid they wanted, but it was a very specific kind. And I didn't fit that. I remember thinking I was stupid. That I was stupid, that I was, that I was this like failure. And yeah, I just remember being so sad at that age. I was really sad. I think it was the only time at that, at that age that I was just so sad. I would come off the bus with my head down and sometimes I would cry and sometimes, and when crying didn't work anymore, I just gave up. And that I think was when my parents got worried. Okay, something, something needs to change. And, and I came here and it was, it was so fast. It was like you went from this really unhappy child to this happy kid where you can, and it makes sense because when you come here at that age especially, the world is open to you. You can explore, you can do, what, you can do anything you want to do. I mean, and I think kids need that. It's something I think in society we've more and more forgotten just how much we need kids to explore and I was suddenly allowed to explore. This was a place where you walked in and it was like there are these kids that want to learn. These were kids that just were learning in their own way and happy and exploring and um, it felt like this like utopian idea of all these kids doing all these things. Yeah, I loved the other kids. I had friends immediately, and I think to its testament, it's, it's a place that also fosters friendship in a very different way because you're letting kids explore and you're letting kids kind of roam and figure out who they are. They're learning the interpersonal skills in a way that they can't do when they're stuck behind a desk. Because in traditional schooling, you know, they can pass a note to a kid, or I don't know, nowadays maybe with a cell phone or something, but that's the most interaction besides the scheduled blocks that they have. And those scheduled blocks are, you know, recess where they can finally run around and they're supposed to somehow in that one hour a day, or maybe if they're really lucky, that hour and a half a day during lunch too, somehow they're supposed to build social skills and interpersonal skills. It's not enough. But here, you can do that all day. So kids naturally learn how to deal with conflict. They naturally learn how to, how to, how to deal with the, the social and interpersonal skills that they need as they get older, even not just in a career, but as children growing, you know, to, to gain self-esteem, to, to be a successful kid. People have a lot of focus on being a successful adult, but to be a successful kid, you need these skills. And here we got that in spades. This school caters to all different kinds of kids. There are quieter kids, there are louder kids, there are kids that are more what people would call more book smart, and kids that are more, I want to say, like experiential. They want to be out there, hands-on doing things. The, the beauty is that because you can explore anything, it allows any kid to really thrive. And that's something that traditional schooling just does not do. One of the really powerful things about this place is that because you have so many different kids that learn differently, work differently, have different skill sets, you're creating a breeding ground of kids that are learning from each other these different skill sets. You know, and your, your peers become your mentors as well. And that's really important. That's the thing, people think classes don't happen here. They do, all the time all the time. Kids are learning all the time here and they sit down and they study here. I went here. I graduated. I loved it here. When I think back on my life, I think this were formative years that were so important to my development and my health and my being, what I consider actually, what I, I think I became a pretty good person overall. Well, the basic philosophy at Alpine Valley School is we believe everyone's born naturally curious. 
All we do is to create a safe and supportive environment where that creativity or that curiosity can flourish, where students can be treated as the individuals that they are and respected accordingly, and where they can learn what they most need to learn in the ways and at the pace that are most appropriate for them. Because here you see it's not so much the child fitting the system, it's more about the system fitting the child. Alpine Valley changed my life. I um, came into the school very withdrawn, very unsure of myself. By the first week, I had just like blossomed. There just was this unfolding of this feeling of tremendous self-worth and appreciation and that people saw me and liked me for who I was and not, you know, that I had performed a certain way on a test or that I had, you know, competed in sports, that it was just me and that was good enough. And so that was a huge change for me and, and one that I think has, has dramatically affected the rest of my life, that, that I still have that feeling of just intrinsic worth and happiness. I've spent my adult life working with adults, trying to reconnect them with their sense of personal purpose, what they care about, who they are, their own sense of authenticity. And it occurred to me, why do we have to do this? It's because when you put children in a typical educational system, you break them away from their sense of self. You separate them from their sense of passion, who they are, what they care about. And when we learned about Alpine Valley School, we thought, wait a minute, here's a place that actually encourages and supports children in their own integrity, their own authenticity. This is about kids. This is an education based on the child, driven by the child, uh, inspired by children, really. And yet there's this community and this place for that to happen. Uh, you know, an environment where children can be part of something while figuring things out and pursuing things for themselves. There's no other school like Alpine Valley. Um, it's, it's completely a new paradigm of, um, of giving kids genuine freedom. Uh, and we may think we give our kids freedom when we give them choices within a certain parameter, for example, whether it's at home or it's at school. It's something different to give them genuine freedom. And something else happens. Seriously, being at school here, it allows you to think, imagine, research what you like, to climb trees really high. Most importantly, so important that it takes up two of my fingers, have fun. I think my favorite thing about being a student here is the freedom to pursue <laughs> your passion, which is like basically the school. You must just find what you want to do, and it's most likely happening and if it's not happening then you can make it happen. So that's the kind of freedom you have here. At the beginning you're like, it's gonna do school where kids do whatever they want all day and everybody's like, fuck! Because we all have this idea that if we don't get told like what to do and what to learn and how to learn it, that we there is no learning and there is learning everywhere. We're sold on a myth. All of us are, as parents, as kids. The myth is that if you attend school and you get good grades, then go to college and get good grades, that you're guaranteed success in life. They don't want them to become experts in doing what other people want them to do. They have to figure out what they want to do. And nobody can figure that out for them. You need to know who you are, what you want in that moment, have an ability to figure out how to get it. We give kids a tremendous amount of respect and room to figure those things out. I sent her to public school kind of like an experiment. I felt like I sent in this really like filled and happy and joyful human being. The interest in learning totally faded. Her self-confidence totally faded. That's just not the environment here. I saw her slowly kind of coming back out of her shell and just being herself and what's more important than that. It's a safe community where you can feel comfortable and um, you're not pressured to do anything. I've always just cared a lot about ending the oppression of young people. We're really about giving people the space. This time where life is the curriculum, the scaled down version of the larger world. 
you're learning more than you think. You're teaching yourself. I never got taught how to read, and I know how to read. I think the underlying lesson that we have here is a much more positive communication to the kids, and that that is we trust you. Holding that pose, like we have this musical. We found other people who are interested in acting. We found someone to direct it. Now she's a staff member here. She loved it so much, it couldn't help but stay. It's definitely a collaborative environment. One, One two, three, you're in town! I try as hard as I can because I wanted to do this. I asked to do this. I got into this. I just joined Sudbury this year. I'm interested in digital art. I'm at a place where I can really explore what I want to do and I can get better at drawing and writing and my photography so I can really focus on like the creative aspects of things. You develop as a person and not as this whole group of kids in a class learning the same thing. What I worried about the school when we first came ended up they ended up being what I saw as tremendous strengths. Age mixing I think is one of the best things about Sudbury. I just really like being around like Older and younger kids, I don't know. 14. 14. Uh, 12. Last year, 12. <laughs> 12. Because there isn't the hyper-competitiveness. And also, I think it's closer to real life. Here at this school, all the students and all the staff, we all have equal authority. The school meeting, it's a democratic committee. All the staff and all the students are all school meeting members. It cultivates a very good atmosphere of respect and trust and responsibility. Everyone has a one-to-one -one vote. As they grow, you see them take more and more control and, and believe more and more in their power. Caliber of people that come out of Sudbury schools is amazing. They're not adult phobic. They're articulate. They're respectful. And the kids leave this and they do extraordinary things. It's beautiful what happens here. I couldn't have picked a better place. The Open School is a self-directed, democratic school serving kids ages 5 to 18. The children are able to self-direct, meaning they can choose to engage in different activities throughout the day that interest them the most. The staff help with projects or like if you need to find out information they'll help you. The open school is different from my previous school because I get to decide what I do with my time and I really enjoy that. It's unlike other schools, well it's unlike all schools to be honest. In that regular school it's just people telling you what to do all the time. When you go to the open school you don't feel like you're going to a school, you feel like you're, you're going to a community where I guess you can say everything is equal. I was going to go into fashion design, which with the help of Open School, I can fully do. The Open School is a rare space where the human spirit is trusted rather than controlled or manipulated. The Open School is a democratic school, which means everyone in the school, students and staff, have the same voice. Everyone gets one vote to decide everything from what the rules are, how the budget gets spent, even hiring and firing of staff. Our, our country values independence and interdependence and being able to take responsibility and ownership of your life and making something from nothing. All of those things are values of the place we live. And so the Open School is, is saying, let's make those the values of our education. Being democratic also means that we care about what the students think. We ask for their opinions and try to get them actively engaged in the governance of the school because we want to create a school for them. At the Open School, kids have the ability to make their own choices. And this means that sometimes they'll make wrong choices, uh, but that's not a problem because when they make wrong choices, they learn how to tell wrong choices from right choices, how to think independently and critically. They learn to take responsibility for themselves. They grow their own personal drive, self-discipline by practicing those things. They don't automatically turn them on at 18. So, you know, it can be really confronting and it can be really difficult, even though it sounds really easy. Oh, you get to do, and I'm using quotes, like whatever you want. But within this framework, 
the work to do whatever you want. It's the work of being an adult. We are a microcosm of our country and we treat the children the same way so that by the time they're adults, they're, they're, they're hitting the ground running. At the open school, students can see that they get to determine their own life, not others, not their parents, not the staff, not society. They get to direct their own course and follow their own inner calling and be themselves. When you focus on mental health, and, and by that I mean people who are valued for who they are, who are accepted, you end up with people who are self-disciplined, focused, who know who they are, know where they're going in life, and therefore actually achieve more. We're teaching kids that they need to understand how to create their own happiness, their own meaning and agency in the world. The long view is that you've been given time to figure out who you are, and so really you can dive in at a much more advanced place. The open school is a place where I can be an artist. Where I can be a scientist. Where I can be a musician. A programmer. Baker. Business owner. The open school is a place where I can be myself. place where like people are encouraged to be themselves. A place where you can learn to just be yourself. It makes me feel way more free. The sense of community, definitely. It's a lot more loving and um, caring. Being here, I just, I have so many passions and I kind of know that like there's a lot of things and a lot of opportunities that I'm going to take. Wicklow's Rugby School is the first democratic school in Ireland. There's no curriculum, no classes. That's not to say that learning doesn't happen. It just happens in a very different way. It's always hands-on, do it together, learn as you go. It's based on the principle that people are natural learners and that what you need to do is facilitate them. We don't teach. <laughs> We're not teachers. I see my role as bringing in um, new things to inspire students. Any decisions that are made are made by the whole school community. When you hand that responsibility over, they kind of run things as good as or better than we do. I can make any decision um, I want to for myself. People follow the rules because it's out of respect for um, out of respect for people around them. For me it's about trusting the children. Hand them their, their education and say what do you need? There is no average day. You can choose if you want to play music or do art. I'm teaching myself Japanese and astronomy. I'm doing my degree in politics, philosophy and economics. Got a pretty good toolbox now and we bring it in and we made lightsabers. It's been so much fun, like we've uh, made boats and circuits, which is lights. We've made alarms for certain doors, so when people open them, alarm goes off with just tin foil and a couple of wires and a battery. Um, we did lemon batteries that weren't very successful, but sometimes the learning is in the failing. Did a big project on dinosaurs. They did this presentation on dinosaurs where they had this book and they gave out quizzes. They had like models for the dinosaurs like to scale with a human model of clay. They get immersed in something. Uh, at one point it was Nerf guns and they were all mad about Nerf guns but it evolved into filmmaking. We're struggling for money and um, our rent is, is very high. We need funds because we're completely self-funded, 100% self-funded, we get money from nowhere. We strive to be as accessible as possible so we charge a sliding scale fee. It all depends on what your yearly income is so we make less than others, other schools would. What we're doing is has a, the potential to influence the school system across Ireland. Uh, there's already a, another school opening in September in Sligo. There's, there'll be one in Cork and Galway next year, I'd say, and more to come. It's really important, and I think it will benefit so many people now and in the future. So we can stay open and not have to go back to regular school and 
make my life miserable. If they know anybody who's struggled in traditional education, if they look back on their schooling and they think, oh God, like that didn't get the best out of me. If you believe any of that, then you should donate. We would like to stay open and keep being happy. <laughs> donate. Today, the most radical form of schooling is something called unschooling. Homeschooling where the parent doesn't teach and there are no tests. The kids do whatever they want. And I was surprised to learn there are also schools that practice that. Kennedy checked one out in Massachusetts. If I show up for school, what's, what's my day? Beats me. At Sudbury Valley School, there are no classes, no tests and no curriculum. Students are only required to show up for five hours a day. When you get here, you have to check in. Okay. And when you leave, you have to check out. These are the only half dives in the day. It's just so amazing to just come here every day and know that I can do whatever I want. Sometimes what they want to do is play video games. Others play music for hours. Why did you start Sudbury Valley School? We had children. My wife and I had children. And our oldest child was getting to be school age. And uh, it was a horrible prospect to put him through the regular school system. They do their best to destroy the natural interests, curiosity, and passions of children. Here, nothing is forced on kids, not even learning to read. Don't you think children will figure that out? I learned to read when I was... Probably 11. Yeah, I taught myself how to read. Oh, really? Yeah. How did you do that? I don't know. I just tried and tried. One of the coolest things about being here is, like, I didn't know if I wanted to go to college last year. Because, like, when you go here, it's not like anybody's telling you, like, yeah, you need to go to college. My path, like, has led me to going to college. At first, it seemed like there were no rules, but there are rules. It's just that the kids have an equal say in making the rules. One vote per kid. The community decides everything. And by the community, I mean the collection of students and adults. There is no hierarchy here whatsoever. When they opened the school, everyone was skeptical. The lead lawyer was pacing back and forth on the floor. He said, four-year-olds, four-year-olds have the vote. My God, they'll just vote candy for themselves. The school will never run. But that's not what happens. The kids run a court system. So this is the meeting of the Judicial Committee. Yep. Yeah. It's basically a school courtroom. Yeah, so instead of going up and telling a teacher, blah, 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 did this, it's like a whole meeting. But I'm so surprised they don't vote themselves candy if they really have this control. Well, it's interesting because since they govern themselves, they're in charge of their own education, the kids are really in charge of the school, and they're much harder on themselves than any teachers or administrators would be. And you have kids raging in age from 4 to 19. A bunch of 19-year-olds don't want 4-year-olds bouncing off the walls all high on sugar. And we, we showed the kid playing video games. I would think, I mean, my, my son would have spent all day playing video games. Yeah, that, that would be my worry, uh, sending my girls <laughs> to a school like this. And I think most parents feel that way. I was really surprised to see that many kids were gathered all different ages around computers with each other. They were collaborating. Many of them were in the art studio. They were painting. They were playing music. All right, painting, playing music, but were any learning math and difficult things? They say they do. I mean, it's a hard thing for an outsider to measure. We saw kids who were engaged on computers. Uh, they weren't necessarily playing computer games. They might have been doing really intense academic research, and many of them were sitting around reading by themselves. And they must learn something because the parents choose this. It's a private school. They have to pay $8,000. They do, and, and there are parents who are obviously non-traditional for whom public school doesn't work. They don't like the model. It doesn't work for their kids. So they seek this school out as a way for their kids to really be in charge of themselves. And they trust, the trust is the most important thing, they trust their kids will learn. And most do go to college. Eighty-five percent of them, we were told by the founders, go on to college. Now, I'd be nervous about enrolling my kids in an unschool. Uh, parents told Kennedy what convinced them is that this school gets kids to like learning.
What is it about the school that attracted you? Um, well, he wants to come, um, which has not been the case in several other schools. He uh, told me the other day, he's like, Mom, wake me up for sure. <laughs> I was like, who are you? What have you done with my teenager who sleeps till two in the afternoon? It like teaches you for the real world. What did you do in public school that's different from here? Everything's different from public school. Yeah. Because you get to have fun all day. Go to a public school and you watch kids come out for recess and they're like being let out of prison. <laughs> Our kids aren't like that. They're not in prison. They don't have to be like that. How would you describe your school? Awesome. awesome. Your friends who go to other schools, are they jealous? Yes. Yes. If you were going to build your perfect school, what would it be like? This. This? this? Would it <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, the kids say it's perfect, but you want to go to college. The colleges want a transcript, grades. A yeah, record. there are no grades, there are no transcripts, there are no classes. There's nothing like that. They prepare themselves for the SAT. They teach themselves higher math. They organize their own education. Sometimes they kind of cram it in in the last year, but they manage to get into college when they want to go. There are now dozens of schools like this around the world. It's hard to measure success when they don't take the standardized tests, but the fact that this, this is not new. This, that school was how old? It's been around since 1968. So and, 40 and they said years the, old. And the the keeps... hippies were the ones who gave them the hardest time. So they, they have survived and, and thrived regardless of people's political affiliations trying to keep them down. You have kids. Would you send them? I would think about non-traditional methods, and I was certainly intrigued by it, but... Like the founder said, there's a giant chasm to overcome in order to trust your kids to go there. I don't think I've overcome that chasm quite yet, but it is interesting. Greetings, I'm the Reverend. Now, in my last video, I explained how the social institution of school is a wretched abomination. But a Reverend, I hear you asking, you know, all three of you, what other alternatives are there? Ah, well that's what this follow-up video is for. Because here, I'm going to explain to you all about the model of education that I fully endorse, the Sudbury model. So sit back, relax, and prepare to get schooled. I'm so funny. The Sudbury model of education completely embraces the ideas of self-directed learning and the basic human right to freedom. Sudbury model schools don't have classes or homework or grades, or tests, or any academic requirements of any kind. You heard what I said. Kids at a Sudbury school are free to spend their day however they like. And more than that, the entire school is run by a completely democratic process. Sudbury schools have weekly school meetings where everything from budget to discipline to the hiring and firing of the adult staff is decided by a direct democracy. And everyone in the school, from the youngest student to the most seasoned adult staff, have equal vote. Now, as I just said, there are adult staff. But their job isn't like a normal teacher. They're not there to guide or to encourage a certain development for the students. They're there as a resource. If a student wants to learn about some field that, that a particular staff has a certain amount of experience in, then they get together and they organize a class based around each of their schedules and each of their levels of commitment or interest or skill in the matter. Other than that, their primary role is really the most obvious one, to be sort of legal guardians, to be there to sort of observe and you know, to intervene if something goes wrong, but their role is entirely passive. They don't act, they react. Now, you're, you're probably wondering why I support such a radical educational model. Well, I support it for two reasons. The first is that it solves all of the problems that I brought up in my last video. It encourages the natural human learning process instead of getting in its way. It promotes and celebrates basic human freedom and instead of squashing it. You know, it gives people room to follow their interests, and to find their own identities, and to be their own people. And the second reason I support it is that, well, it works. You know, this is not a theoretical model. Now, these schools exist, and they've existed for over 40 years. The first was the Sudbury Valley School. That's where they got their name from. It was founded in 1968 in Framingham, Massachusetts, and has been going strong ever since. There's over 40 of them all around the world. And the students that have come out of them are happy, well-adjusted, functioning adults. So that's why I support it. I support it because it works. And history's proven it works. 
and I want to tell as many people as possible about this because really it's kind of the education world's best kept secret. You know, not many people know about it. Few people even talk about it. Most educators don't even want to admit that it exists if they've even heard of it. And it's a wonderful, revolutionary idea. And I really want to see more schools like this created. Now, I'm not sure how much more in-depth I can get in a video like this, because I have a 10 minute time on it. So I'm going to leave a bunch of links down below to all sorts of stuff that might give you a little more information about this, to give you a little more insight. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments below. I'll try and answer them maybe in the next video. And really just think about it, talk about it. If you don't think it'll work, try and articulate why you don't think it'll work. Try and find if there are any Sudbury schools near you. Maybe even check out one of their open houses, see if it'd be good for one of your kids. And if you think that any of the things I've said about modern education, about the way people learn, makes any sense, just really just try and keep an open mind. Look into it and decide for yourself. And if you're so inclined, Inside our bodies are chemicals that are trying to get us to do things that are in the best interest of us. They are endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin. Endorphins. Endorphins are designed to do one thing and one thing only. Mask physical pain. If you're a runner, as you've heard of a runner's high, what's happening is when that runner is out there pushing their bodies harder than they've ever pushed before, they feel good. And then an hour later, they're in pain for damage they caused their muscles an hour before. Endorphins, they're designed to mask physical pain. Dopamine. Dopamine is the feeling that you accomplish something you set out to accomplish. The whole purpose of dopamine is to make sure that we get stuff done. This is why you must write down your goals. There's a biological reason for that. We have very, very visually oriented animals. You have to be able to see the goal for it to biologically stay focused. And every time we achieve a goal and it makes us feel like we're making progress to the, the vision we can see, we keep going and going and going until we achieve something remarkable. You have to be able to see it. Dopamine. Dopamine comes with a warning. Dopamine is highly, highly, highly addictive. Here are some other things that release dopamine. Alcohol, nicotine, gambling, your cell phone. We can also get addicted to performance in our companies when all they do is give us numbers to hit, numbers to hit, numbers to hit, and a bonus you get, and a bonus you get, and a bonus you get. All they're doing is feeding us with dopamine, and we can't help ourselves. All we do is want more, more, more. One of the things we know about dopamine addict is they will do anything to get another hit, sometimes at the sacrifice of their own resources and their relationships. Dopamine is dangerous if it is unbalanced. Serotonin. Serotonin is responsible for feelings of pride and status. This is why public recognition is very important. We are social animals and we need the recognition of others. This is why we have commencement for graduation. You could get an email that says, congratulations, you fulfilled all the requirements for graduation. In close, please print out the PDF of your diploma. Wouldn't feel so good, right? So instead, we have a big ceremony to recognize the accomplishment. And in the audience, we put our family and our friends and our teachers, all of those in our tribe who've supported us and watched our backs as we've made it through. And then we show up on that day and we go up on that stage and we take our diploma. It feels great. We feel our status rise. We feel our pride go up. And here's the best part about serotonin. At the exact moment that you took your diploma and you felt that surge of serotonin go through your body, your parents sitting in the audience also got a surge of serotonin and also felt an intense pride watching you graduate. And this is what serotonin is trying to do. It is trying to reinforce the relationship between parent and child, coach and player, the caregiver and the one who is grateful for the support they are given. The problem is, you can trick serotonin. We live in a materialist society, so we judge status very often in our country based on how much money you make. So any conspicuous display of wealth raises your status. 
This is why they put the logos on the outside. No good on the inside, nobody can see them. You can actually feel your confidence rise when you put on the stuff because it's showing this display of status. It feels great. The problem is there was no real relationship that was reinforced because of it. You tricked the system. That's why we keep trying to accomplish things and accumulate more and more material goods, and yet we never feel successful because there was no relationship. We tricked it. We gained it. Oxytocin. This is the best chemical of all. Oxytocin is the feeling of love, trust, and friendship. Oxytocin is that intense feeling of safety that someone's got your back. There are multiple ways you can get oxytocin. One way to get it is physical contact. Hugging feels wonderful. When women give birth to children, huge surge of oxytocin in their body. This is what's responsible for the mother-child bond. It's all that oxytocin in the system. Another way you can get oxytocin is through acts of human generosity. Doing nice things for people. Remember, our bodies are trying to get us to repeat behaviors that are in our best interest, and it's making us feel good when we see or do acts of human generosity so that we will do them. In fact, the more oxytocin you have in your body, the more generous you actually become. It gets better than that. Lots of oxytocin in your body inhibits addiction. It boosts your immune system. It makes you healthier. That's why happy people live longer. It's why couples live longer. It increases our ability to solve problems. It increases our creativity. It's really good for us, and it's not addictive. It just feels great. There's one more chemical I haven't told you about. Cortisol. Cortisol is the feeling of stress and the feeling of anxiety. We share these chemicals with all the social mammals. Cortisol is designed to keep us alive. It is the first stage of fight or flight. It makes us paranoid. It makes all of our senses hyper-attuned to look for danger. It injects glucose into our muscles to make us stiff and ready to go in case we need to fight or flight. It increases our heart rate like crazy. Cortisol, to get all of that extra energy, it needs to shut down non-essential systems. So it shuts off things like growth. You don't need your fingernails to grow at that moment. It shuts it off. The other thing it shuts off is our immune system. You don't need it in that moment. The problem is you're not supposed to have cortisol in your system all the time. You're supposed to have it in and then gone. One of the things cortisol does, it inhibits the release of oxytocin. Biologically, if you work in a high-stress environment where you don't feel safe, you are biologically less empathetic and less generous. Alcoholics Anonymous has been highly effective for decades. Alcoholics Anonymous knows that if you master all 11 steps, but not the 12th, you will drink again. The 12th step is the commitment to help another alcoholic. Service. Service to another. Oxytocin wins. Serotonin wins. The more we look after each other, the safer we feel, the more we feel like we belong, and the more we will work together to confront the dangers outside. 